The psalmist says, our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Uh, welcome to Christ Central Presbyterian Church. Uh, we greet you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And though this online format is certainly no substitute for the public worship of God by his gathered people, uh, nevertheless, as we stay in our homes during this time, may we, in some sense, lift our voices together as we rejoice and worship our risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And a few announcements. The liturgy of this service has been emailed out to all of our members and friends, but it can also be found on our church website under bulletins as well as posted underneath this video on YouTube. And as this pandemic continues, all in-person church activities continue to be canceled through uh, May the 3rd. And as we abide by all health recommendations, our session will be evaluating when it will be safe to resume in-person meetings uh, once again. Uh, however, we are continuing many ministries of this church through electronic means, and if you would like to participate in any of these, simply contact the church office via phone or email, and we'd be happy to provide you with a list of options. Well, as we uh, worship in our own homes, uh, God's word calls us to worship this morning from Psalm 107, uh, verses 1 through 3, as well as verse 43. And the psalmist states, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say this. Those he redeemed from the hand of the foe, those he gathered from the lands from east and west, from north and south, whoever is wise, let him heed these things and consider the great love of the Lord. Would you uh, look to the Lord with me as we pray. Father, we do come to you through Jesus Christ, the risen King. In our homes, we worship and exalt you this morning, for you are good, and your love endures forever. Your power is above all things. You have redeemed us from the hand of the foe, and your kingdom has no end. We humbly ask that you would draw near to us, that you would receive our worship, for we approach you through our risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit. You are one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, I invite... Would you join me as we look to the Lord in prayer? Father, uh, indeed your law is perfect. And as those who have been redeemed by Jesus, we love your law and we delight to obey it. Nevertheless, we struggle with indwelling sin. And every day we fail to keep your law. And so we ask that you would give us contrite hearts this morning as we confess our sins, and as we seek your renewed mercy. Would you freely pardon all who repent and turn to you? 
May you fulfill in every repentant heart the promise of redeeming grace, forgiving all our sins and cleansing us from a guilty conscience all through the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ our Lord. We thank you that though the wages of sin is death, your word proclaims that the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, as those who have been forgiven, we approach you in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, bringing to you our requests and our intercessions. Father, we know that you care for the whole world, and so we pray for all people, especially as our world is practically shut down and people are isolated from one another. May you use this time of forced isolation to bring about contemplation in the hearts of all people. And may you, you use that to draw all men to yourself. We also pray for those who govern in countries around the world. We ask that you would give wisdom to world leaders and to local leaders as they consider lifting restrictions during this pandemic. Father, may it not be done too soon or hastily, but also not dragged out unnecessarily because of fear. And Father, we pray for Christ's church as she exists throughout the world. May she display compassion as she submits to local governing authorities and as she boldly proclaims the good news of Jesus Christ. May you bless ministers and elders and deacons as they strive to serve well during this period of separation from one another. Father, we also pray for our missionaries. We think this morning of Rodney and Jana Davila. We also pray for Moises Campos as he ministers and uh, mentors pastors in Costa Rica. We pray for Dave and Paige Haas, for Don and Leah Vanderplug, for Andrew Newman, SIE ATN, and the Reverend B. Kirk. We ask that you would bless, sanctify, provide for, and make fruitful the ministries to which you have called each of these two. And Father, for those with special needs, would you hear our requests? We thank you for the life of Dave Barden. We rejoice that he is at rest and at home with you. But we also grieve over our great loss. So we ask that you would draw near to us, that you would comfort us as only you can. Be especially with Pat, his wife of 59 years, and his children, Debbie and Linda and Carl and their families. Father, would you also be with the family members of Carol Alt as they grieve her death? Thank you for the ministry she offered to Christ's church during her earthly life. We continue to pray for Mr. Orville and Trudy Bergen. Father, would you uh, give them grace as they struggle with various health issues? Would you uh, strengthen and give healing to their bodies? We also continue to pray for Mr. Bruno Gravanti as he struggles with lung cancer. Father, we do give you thanks for answering our prayers. Thank you for using the means of medication to reduce his pain. Would you continue uh, to draw near to him uh, during this time of suffering? Would you bless him, Lord? Pray that you'd also be with Marcia Craig, her step-grandson Ethan. Be also with Brian Tonis, Alan Dostal, Judy Smith, Mercedes Kirk, St. Claude McDonald. Laura Cameron, Lenore Ball, and Debbie Kanger. Would you restore the health and sustain each of these in difficulty and draw near to them at their point of need? Father, we also pray for all those who are ill from COVID-19. Would you heal their bodies? Would you give grace to medical workers who care for those who are sick? And Father, we do ask that you would protect the elderly and the vulnerable 
uh, during this pandemic. Father, would you also be with those who have been laid off already or those who fear losing their jobs in light of pandemic restrictions? May you provide for all of their needs. And so, Father, we do thank you for hearing our prayers and our requests. And we offer up all these in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. We come now to a time of reading of sacred scripture. So at home, I invite you to follow along in your own Bibles. And as we read three scripture lessons, and I'll be reading from the 1984 edition of the NIV. Our first scripture lesson this morning comes from Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. Hear what the Lord says to you, O house of Israel. This is what the Lord says. Do not learn the ways of the nations, or be terrified by signs in the sky, though the nations are terrified by them. For the customs of the peoples are worthless. They cut a tree out of the forest, and a craftsman shapes it with his chisel. They adorn it with silver and gold. They fasten it with hammer and nails, so that it will not totter. Like a scarecrow in a melon patch, their idols cannot speak. They must be carried, because they cannot walk. Do not fear them. They can do no harm, nor can they do any good. No one is like you, O Lord. You are great. Your name is mighty in power. Who should not revere you, O King of the nations? This is your due. Among all the wise men of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is none, no one like you. They are all senseless and foolish. They are taught by worthless wooden idols. Hammered silver is brought from Tarshish and gold from Uphaz. What the craftsmen and goldsmith have made is then dressed in blue and purple, all made by skilled workers. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God, the eternal King. When he is angry, the earth trembles. The nations cannot endure his wrath. This is the word of the Lord. Our second scripture lesson comes from the book of Colossians, chapter 2, verses 6 through 15. And the Apostle Paul writes, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him you are also circumcised in the putting off of your sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by the hands of men, but with a circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, raised with him through your faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. This is the word of the Lord. Our third scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7, verses 1 through 13. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus. 
and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were unclean, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the traditions of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders, instead of eating their food with unclean hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. And he said to them, You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your traditions. For Moses said, Honor your father and mother. And anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But you say that if a man says to his father or mother, whatever help you might otherwise have received from me is Corban, that is a gift devoted to God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And you do many things like that. And this is the word of the Lord. I invite you to follow along as we sing the doxology. been in a series of messages through Paul's letter to the Colossians for a number of weeks leading up to Palm Sunday and Easter. We find ourselves this morning on the second Sunday of Easter in 2020 in Colossians chapter 2 verses 6 through 15. This is really the heart of the book as the Apostle Paul begins to raise the issues of false teachers and false doctrine that has been unleashed in the church and that is wreaking havoc. And so the Apostle Paul, beginning in verse 6, begins to outline what he wants believers to do, what he wants them to think, how he wants them to do theology. And you'll notice with me this morning that he gives several features of the Christian life almost as a progression in the Christian life. Notice, first of all, the foundation in Christ, our foundation in Christ in verses 6 through 8. And then secondly, our completion in Christ in verses 9 and 10. Thirdly, our acceptance in Christ in verses 11 and 12. And then finally, our forgiveness in Christ in verses 13 through 15. So along with an outline of the message, join me in prayer now. Let's ask our Lord to bless our time of study together. Heavenly Father, I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Father, we wish to see Jesus and him only. We pray for a visitation of your Holy Spirit as our master teacher. That you would lead and guide us into all truth. As we look together at your inspired, inerrant, and infallible word. So Lord, bless these moments now we ask in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Well, first of all, I want you to notice that Paul begins or introduces this section with our foundation in Christ in verses 6 through 8. And he does two things, basically. Number one, Paul tells the Colossian Christians what to pursue, and then secondly, what to avoid. He mentions what to pursue in verses 6 and 7. They have received Christ as Lord, so they have been rooted in the faith. And now he reminds them that the Lord is building them up and establishing them in their faith. One of the things that you will notice over and over again in this entire section is the words in Christ or with Christ. The whole section is dominated by our union with Christ. And that begins here. I'm reminded of the words of Psalm 1, verse 3. The godly man, the godly woman is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. It does not wither, and all that he does, he prospers. The Bible makes it clear that we as Christians have a need for growth and development. God did not save us through the blood of Jesus Christ so that we just simply sit and enjoy our salvation. No, he saved us, and just like a plant, we are called to grow. We are called to grow spiritually. That's why 1 John 2, 6 says, The one who says he abides in him, that is in Jesus, ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. And that's what Paul is saying here in Colossians 2, 6, and 7. I want you to walk in the same manner that Christ walked. What does that mean practically? It means that if you're a Christian, you ought to seek to grow. You ought to seek to appropriate the means of grace at your disposal. You ought to seek to be a part of Christ's church. You ought to seek to grow in his word, to attend Bible studies, to take advantage of the sacraments and prayer, and yes, church discipline. There's so many people that are professing Christians that have no vital connection to Christ's church. And ladies and gentlemen, we need to be reminded that we are the visible body of Christ on earth. And the church, with its offices and ordinances, is an established institution that every Christian ought to be a vital part of. And that should be a vital part of their life. And so Paul tells us to pursue this sense of growth and development. Now, notice secondly in verse 8, Paul tells us what to avoid. The worldly philosophy. Look at verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception. According to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. You see, part of our foundation as Christians is not only what we're supposed to pursue, it also includes what we're to avoid. And any type of teaching, any type of thinking that moves away from Christ as Lord is in error. You know, the word philosophy comes from two Greek words. Phileo, that is to love, and sophia, that is wisdom. And so philosophy is the love of wisdom. Unfortunately, most philosophers throughout history have denied the existence of God. And that's what leads to all kinds of false belief, like deism. Deism, you know, God uh, created the world and like a giant clock, he wound it up and threw it into order. And then he lays back and has nothing to do with it. I can't help but think of that song years ago by Bette Midler, from a distance. As if God is not involved, he's not personal, we're all on our own. Or pantheism. You know, pantheism is the belief that God is found in everything. In this pulpit. In all forms of matter. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a heresy. Ultimately, truth is not a matter of empirical investigation. That is, as man looks at his created universe or the created order... If he denies the existence of God or suppresses the existence of God, he begins to say that truth is a matter of what I observe with my five senses. Or my reason, rationalism. All of these are philosophies. They do not take into consideration 
the sinfulness of man. And rationalism, especially the sinfulness of man's mind. We in the Reformed tradition talk about total depravity. It does not mean that we are as sinful as we can possibly be. What it does mean is that we are sinful in all parts of our being. And that includes the mind, ladies and gentlemen. Our ability to exercise logic and reason is not neutral. It has been stained by sin, just like every other aspect of our being. And so worldly philosophy has no room for God. It's man's ignorant and arrogant way to find meaning and purpose and significance and fulfillment in this brief life on earth. Now, to a large degree, this is what Jesus was dealing with. <clears throat> if I can give you an illustration of it, in our gospel reading for this morning, in Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 13. You see, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were very religious. The scribes were very religious people. But inside, they began to deny the existence of God. And that's what led to their traditions that is, their own teachings from the basics of man rather than the word of God. They began to deny the word of God, and that's what Jesus called them out on. Godless philosophy with its enthronement of man's reason and experience as the ultimate judge of what is true has led to the demise, not the development, of humanity. I remember the 19th century German philosopher, Friedrich Nietzsche, as he scorned Christianity as the religion of weaklings and one of the first to proclaim God is dead, although Nietzsche found himself as a victim of his own philosophy. He died and for about the last 11 years of his life, he went insane as a result of his obsession to see himself as the one who could fix everything. That man was the measure of all things. Well, we could go on and on with worldly philosophy. But again, it, that which eliminates God from the picture and his word as the source and the basis of absolute truth. Now remember, Paul is dealing with a problem in Colossae. He never names it specifically, but we know from a study of the book that it involves the elements of legalism, Jewish legalism, mysticism and asceticism that if I treat my body in a certain way with certain techniques and I deal with myself that way that I will find enlightenment that I will find ultimate meaning and it's sad because the Colossian problem had Colossian teachers who were running around teaching things that left individuals insecure and who they are, isolated from one another and with a sense of guilt and shame. And that's what Satan always does. He promotes insecurity. He promotes isolation. He promotes guilt and shame. And that is the result of worldly philosophy, the very opposite of what our Lord came to. To offer us. And see, this is what Paul is going to deal with now in verses 9 through 15. He's going to deal with those benefits that we have in Christ. He tells us to have a foundation, to receive Christ, and to go on growing in Him. Avoid worldly philosophy. Well, now he tells us three things that we have in Christ, and these are not new. He's already mentioned them, but the thrust in this passage is to show us that by these benefits, we will be able to avoid false teaching, heresy, worldly philosophy as it creeps in to Christian doctrine. Notice with me, first of all, our completion in Christ. Look at verses 9 and 10 with me. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete. He is the head over all rule and authority. Paul is reminding us of the incarnation of Jesus. We studied this in chapter 1 in verses 10 through 15 several weeks ago. And here Paul is saying that just as Christ was the perfect, complete, infinite God-man, so also we sinners 
discover the fullness, that is the complete understanding of humanity, who we are and why we are here in our union with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this is very important because the opposite of a strong, healthy sense of completion, of purpose and significance is a crippling sense of insecurity and emptiness. That is to say, I need someone or something to make me complete. And a sense of insecurity, a, a sense of incompletion, a sense of emptiness is a strong weapon in the hands of Satan as he works through false teachers, both then and now. I mean, historically, we can see that this has always been one of the tactics of Satan. We can consider back in the Garden of Eden, Satan's temptation of Eve. After God blessed her and Adam with everything that they needed, they were complete. They had a sense of satisfaction. But Satan came and said, you're missing out on something. You need something else to make you wise. You have not tasted the sweetness of that tree. Did God actually say, don't eat of any tree? He began to confuse Eve. And part of that confusion and part of that temptation was to throw before her the lie that somehow life was incomplete without the things that Satan could give. It's no wonder Jesus said in John 10, 10, the thief, Satan, comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I came, saith the Lord Jesus, that they might have life and have it abundantly. See, a driving tyrannical pressure to rebel against God and his word in order to find true freedom, a sense of completion, but not in Christ Jesus, only in something or someone this world has to offer. Think about it. Think about the if onlys in your life. People say all the time, if only I were more beautiful, if only I had more money, if only I were more successful, if only I were married, then everything would be wonderful. If only I can get that promotion or that job, if only I can get that girl, that guy, the car, and it goes on and on because we think in those things that this world has to offer, they will give us a sense of completion. They will give us a sense of significance and fulfillment. But ladies and gentlemen, nothing and no one in this life can give you that sense of completion and fulfillment only the Lord Jesus Christ can give. And that's why we read Jeremiah 10 verses 1 through 10. The search for completion, for significance, for fulfillment apart from God always leads to idolatry. And what can an idol do? Ultimately, nothing except suck the life out of you whenever we hold it up as a replacement, as a substitute for the living God. I remember the words of a 20th century philosopher, the French existentialist Jean-Paul Sartre, who was also an atheist. He wrote a novel named Nausea. And the main character in that novel says this, quote, every existing thing is born without reason, goes on living out of weakness and dies by accident. And in another place, he said, man is a useless passion. Now, in one sense, he had that right. Because in our sinfulness, left in our sinfulness, we have no meaning, no significance. But you know, people stop short of Christ and they adopt the same type of thinking and philosophy that Sartre had. No wonder there's so many teenage suicides. No wonder there's so many children born out of wedlock. No wonder we have alcohol and substance abuse because too often, ladies and gentlemen, we as sinners try to find our sense of significance in those things that the world says will fulfill you. But it's a lie. And you know something? It's crept into the church. I mean, Easter Sunday with no churches available, I turned on my television. 
And there were two religious programs, each about an hour long. One was a Roman Catholic mass. And the other was an evangelical Christian extravaganza. And the individuals that spoken there are ones known to me as those who present Christianity as a means of becoming wealthy and prosperous, successful, winsome, and attractive. That is not the religion of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. Lose your life and you'll find it. Give yourself to me, and you'll find out what living is all about. You'll taste the bread of heaven, and I will put inside of you an artesian well, a fountain of living water, he said in John 7. You'll be complete. You will not have to live with this sense of insecurity and emptiness. I believe it was St. Augustine who said, God created us, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. Because that's why we were made, ladies and gentlemen, is to have fellowship with God and to glorify him, not to sate ourselves with everything this world has to offer. Whether it's hedonism or nihilism or any other type of ism, it'll always lead us astray. Paul is saying to us, even though you may not be able to name or identify these philosophies, what you have to do is be careful that they don't deviate from Christ as the centerpiece and your union with him. You know, they say that the U.S. Treasury has a way of training agents in order to identify counterfeit bills. One would think that they spent most of their time looking at counterfeit bills. No. The way of training is to be looking at the authentic article over and over and over again. This fixation on that which is authentic gives the ability to spot that which is phony and fake. And ladies and gentlemen, that's true in theology too. Whenever we fixate on Christ who is the head of all rule and authority, then we'll be able to identify when a preacher, a teacher, a philosophy begins to deviate away from the centrality of the eternal Son of God. The Apostle Paul said in another place, we take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Well, that is our completion in Christ. Now notice... Secondly, which probably is the most difficult portion of the passage, verses 11 and 12, and I've labeled this our acceptance in Christ. The Colossian heresy was a mixture of pagan philosophy and Jewish legalism. And apparently the false teachers taught that circumcision was necessary for salvation. Submission to circumcision as an act of dedication and consecration urged on the Colossians by the new teachers. It stood for a second initiation, a hoop to jump through, if you will, subsequent to baptism. And by this, the believer would enter into a full inheritance. Verses 11 and 12 are packed. And I don't know how many different commentators I read this past week. Some of them speak of circumcision as the, the removal of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And they focus on sanctification in these words. But remember Paul's polemic. He is dealing with false teachers. He is dealing with Jewish legalism. He is dealing with those who always want to keep growing Christians. They want to keep a step ahead of them. And so they follow their teachings. And they remain without the whole picture. Every Jewish boy was circumcised on the eighth day after his birth, according to Leviticus chapter 12. And it was the sign that belonged to the covenant nation in Genesis 17. But membership in the covenant community did not guarantee individual salvation. And you see what? That's what the false teachers do. They, they take away from your completion in Christ, but also they want to take away from your acceptance in Christ. That is, you have to keep doing things, not by God's grace, but you have to keep doing extra things to attain this standing or to keep this standing. The Apostle Paul is very clear here. 
as he would be later on in Romans 2, that circumcision did not guarantee individual salvation. Ladies and gentlemen, nothing we do can add to the grace of God in the finished work of Jesus Christ. It is by grace that we're saved through faith and that not of ourselves, it is a gift of God so that no one can boast. And Paul says in Romans 2, 25 and 28, indeed, circumcision is a value if you practice the whole law. But if you are a transgressor of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, neither is circumcision that which is outward of the flesh. But he who is one, a Jew inwardly, circumcision of the heart. And this is not new. Moses said in Deuteronomy 10, 16, circumcise then your heart and stiffen your neck no more. And later on in chapter 30, verse 6 of Deuteronomy, he says, Moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul in order that you may live. And so here with this background, Paul is saying to the Colossians, you do not need to have the old covenant sign of circumcision. You have received the circumcision of Christ. You have been brought into the covenant community, not by an outward sign or symbol on your body, but by the inward reality of the cleansing work of Jesus Christ. Just as the foreskin was cut away, Paul is using that symbolically to say when Christ redeemed you, he cleansed you of the body of flesh. Now we still have the sin nature that we have to deal with. But before God, we are clean, ladies and gentlemen. We are spotless, sinless, as Jude says at the end of his epistle. And so just as the old covenant Jews were circumcised to demonstrate their acceptance into the kingdom, so also we as Christians are baptized and brought in to the kingdom. But ladies and gentlemen, Paul's major emphasis here is not on physical baptism. It's true that baptism is the fuller picture, the fuller pattern of circumcision, just like the Lord's Supper is the fuller pattern of the Passover. But you see, Paul's intention here is to demonstrate acceptance. You are part of the covenant family, the new covenant in Christ. It is not a matter of an outward sign. Now we as Christians get baptized. But remember, the thief on the cross was never baptized. It was not an article. It was not an issue for salvation. It's only by the grace of God that we're saved. And so Paul is saying several things here. Number one, that baptism is the fuller pattern of circumcision. But chiefly what he is saying is you don't have to be circumcised. You do not have to submit to Jewish legalism in order to be a Christian. You are accepted in the beloved on the basis of Christ finished work on the cross alone. And there is nothing you can do to cleanse yourself of your sin because Christ, and notice the verbs in the passage in the past tense, he's already taken away that body of sin, that flesh. There's a sense here in which there is an already and a not yet. Christ is dealt with our flesh. That means we stand faultless and sinless before him. And that is a motivation for Christian living. But we still have the flesh to deal with in that sense that we have a sin nature. And the flesh sets his desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And Paul talks about that through his other epistles. How there's always going to be a war going on while we're here. But you see what Paul is doing practically. Whereas completion in Christ should eliminate any sense of personal insecurity and emptiness. And our acceptance in Christ should eliminate any sense of isolation. You know, isolation is one of the worst things a human being can be subject to. We think about the global pandemic and the isolation that it has brought. Every one of us going away to our homes, isolated and secluded. Once those are tested for the coronavirus, isolation sets in. Self-isolation. We hear all of that these days. We hear about solitary confinement, one of the worst forms of punishment in prison. Well, Paul is saying, you don't have to stand on the outskirts. 
and listen to some guru tell you to do something else in order to truly be accepted, to truly be enlightened. No, just as our union in Christ makes us complete, so it also makes us accepted in the beloved family because we have been cleansed by Christ. And our baptism demonstrates that, the washing away of sin and the coming of the Holy Spirit as we are brought into the new covenant family based on the merits of Jesus Christ alone. And that's very important, ladies and gentlemen. There is a sense of isolation in our world even before the pandemic. People engage in sexual immorality. People smoke marijuana. They take drugs. They try to drown themselves often because they're lonely. They're isolated. One of the beautiful features of Christianity is that sense of not only union with Christ, fellowship with Christ, but also fellowship with one another. And a sense of unity, not uniformity. We're all different. But unity, where we come together in Jesus. What a beautiful picture. Well, I must hurry. We have our foundation in Christ our completion in Christ, Paul says, our acceptance in Christ, and finally, our forgiveness in Christ. In verses 13 through 15, our forgiveness in Christ should eliminate that sense of guilt and debt due to our sins. And ladies and gentlemen, if a sense of incompletion, a sense of emptiness, and a sense of isolation is crippling enough, think about the sense of guilt the sense of death. There are so many that live with guilt for sins. It's important to find security and it's important to find acceptance in Jesus Christ. But even these, apart from the forgiveness of our sins, would be meaningless. And how did God secure forgiveness of our sins? Paul lays it out beautifully. First of all, through regeneration to a new life. Look at verse 13. You were dead in your transgressions and uncircumcision of your flesh. He made you alive together with him. That is God Almighty, God the Father brought us alive in Jesus Christ. As Christ rose from the grave, so we begin a new life. We're born again. Ladies and gentlemen, people are not spiritually sick, they're dead. And there's a big difference between the two. A dead person cannot respond unless there is stimuli from an outside source. And that's exactly what happens to us. We have to be born again. We have to be regenerated. We cannot come to new spiritual life apart from him. And this involves not only regeneration, but cancellation of debt. Look at verse 14. Having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. What a beautiful word picture. The law of God condemns every human being. It creates a crushing sense of debt that we cannot repay. We can never establish our righteousness before a holy God. And so God did for us what we could not do for ourselves. He came to earth in the form of a man, Jesus Christ, the infinite God-man, the perfect God-man. And he lived a perfect life to fulfill the demands of the law for us. And then he died on the cross in order to pay for all the infractions against the law on our behalf. And so our debt is fully, completely paid off and we stand before the Lord free of guilt but it doesn't stop there look at verse 15 regeneration to a new life cancellation of the debt and destruction of the enemy these words remind us of the ultimate victory we have in Christ Jesus and note it's not a circumstantial victory what I mean by that is not a daily deliverance from my circumstances so that I get an A on the test or so that my marriage remains stable or so that I don't lose my job, but an eternal victory. I no longer have to live with a sense of guilt and shame and disgrace of my sins. Why? Because I've been regenerated in Christ, born again, 
and the cancellation of my debt to the law has been fulfilled. But look at verse 15. He has disarmed the rulers and authorities. He's made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. God Almighty triumphed over those authorities and powers in the spiritual realm. And ladies and gentlemen, that points chiefly to Satan and all of his demons, the accuser of the brethren. And the Bible says not only have we been regenerated, but our debt has been canceled because Christ dealt the significant blow against Satan on the cross. No wonder the apostle John said in his first epistle, chapter 3, verse 8, the reason the Son of God, Jesus, appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And him who causes thievery and death is no longer your master. Would that we could get a hold of that. And ladies and gentlemen, all of this is in Christ Jesus. It points to our union with Christ. And when we're born again, when we embrace the finished work of Christ on the cross, we are joined together in him. We lose our lives and we find ourselves in Christ. That's why Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. You lose your life, you'll find it. And how many people out there are searching for a sense of completion, a sense of acceptance, and a sense of forgiveness? Paul says it's all in Christ. You don't need a guru. You don't need somebody in front of you blazing the trail and telling you to catch up. It's all yours for the asking. Jesus will come into your heart. The Bible makes it clear that those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved from their sins. If you believe by faith, you turn away from your sin and repentance, and in faith you trust Jesus Christ alone for salvation. All these benefits become yours. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the Apostle Paul and your usage of him. Father, we thank you that nothing in this world and no one from a human standpoint can fulfill the longing of our heart, our body, our soul beyond Jesus. Lord, help us to embrace you. Those of us that are believers of fresh and anew, may we find our completion, our acceptance, and our forgiveness in you and not in our actions. Or not in some vain hope in this life. And Lord, for those who have never known you, I pray that as only you can, that you would sovereignly, supernaturally invade their hearts by the foolishness of the message preached, that you might be glorified and that they might be redeemed. Lord, do all these things and more. We'll give you the praise and the glory and the honor for all that you will do. And we make our prayer humbly. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn is number 267, The Day of Resurrection. And we'll sing verses 1 and 3 together.
Receive now the benediction from our Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace, both now and forevermore.